In this video, we're going to explore the story of the Stopwatch Gang, a notorious trio of robbers who gained infamy for their clockwork precision and efficiency in heists worth millions and elusive moves that kept law enforcement agencies on their toes for years. This video delves into the intriguing and detailed account of the gang's criminal story, from humble beginnings to the very peak of their swiftness, wit, and fearlessness. The gang consisted of three individuals, Lionel Wright, Patrick Mitchell, and Stephen Reed, all Canadians. The ringleader of the group was Patrick Patty Mitchell. He was born in Ottawa, Ontario, in 1942, into a working-class Catholic family. Since childhood, he was already considered a delinquent and was always the brain of the crime operations, helping his partners figure out ways to commit crimes effortlessly and safely without ever exposing himself. From his criminal beginnings, he became known as Bon Vivant for always being well-dressed and soft-spoken, as said by Reed. Before meeting with his future criminal partners, he lived a double life switching between living with his wife and son and hanging out at the Belle Claire Tavern, where he would later meet and unite with Reed and Wright. Next is Stephen Reed. He was born in Massey, Ontario in 1950. The same as the ringleader, Reed began to have criminal tendencies from childhood. His first visit to jail was at 16 years old. At that time, he was involved in petty crimes, selling drugs, and he was already a drug addict himself. At about 18 to 19 years old, based on his words, he became a professional and started committing bank robberies in Toronto and Ontario, for which he got 10 years of imprisonment. In 1973, on a day pass from the prison, he managed to run away by crawling out of a restaurant's bathroom window and fleeing to Ottawa, where he would meet Wright and Mitchell. And the third one, Lionel Wright. He was born and raised in Ottawa. A shy and quiet student who lived with his mother, he was working as a night clerk at a trucking firm where he first met Mitchell, with whom he began working together to routinely steal small quantities of low-value stuff, such as cigarettes, alcohol, and candy and other goods, while at the same time covering their tracks with forged papers and other clever tricks. He was the details guy, as described by Reed, brilliant, dependable, and with an amazing memory. After this concise introduction, we can clearly see their personal histories, as well as their criminal tendencies and special skills. Each of them provided for the teamwork, which was the reason for their unprecedented crime success rate. Now, we're going to explore their future criminal endeavors, which left a distinct mark in the crime history of the world, and learn the reasons why they were added to the FBI's most wanted list, and became known as the Stopwatch Gang and how they managed to commit up to 140 robberies, amounting to $15 million, with a 100% success rate, without anyone getting hurt or caught. Let's begin. The next few years, since Wright and Mitchell began working together at the trucking company, Wright stole anything they wanted, and Mitchell was responsible for finding buyers and selling the goods on the black market. Well, the quantity of thefts escalated from several boxes to entire trailer loads. By the end of their several-year-long robbery business, the company found out who was behind the ongoing robberies and fired them. This experience left an indelible effect on them. They realized that they couldn't go back to normal 9-to-5 jobs anymore, as they described it themselves. We have expensive habits now. Later, both Mitchell and Wright were invited to an apartment basement by some former prisoners to discuss their achievements and reputation among the elite of the criminal underworld. While there, they not only received their recognition, but also met Stephen Reed, who was hiding there after escaping from the prison. They quickly got to know each other and decided to work together as a team. For the next year, the trio focused on Ottawa's delivery networks and made money at an increasing rate to satisfy their hunger for wealth. It wasn't rare for the team to get twenty to $30,000 in one day. As they noted, nothing was safe from us. This was only the beginning of their teamwork, which consisted of fairly modest deeds, at first. 
Next, we'll uncover the start of their criminal journey to international fame as one of the most impressive and successful robbers in the history of financial crimes. It all began with Mitchell and Reed spending their time at a pool hall, which they considered their entertainment. There they met a man called Gary Katonch, who worked as an Air Canada baggage handler and was selling expensive stolen calculators from the delivery items. They got introduced to each other, and from that point on, they began seeing an opportunity for their cooperation. Gary told them that at his work, a monthly shipment of gold was coming through the airport to the Royal Canadian Mint, and the security was laid back, which instantly sparked their interest. There, they came up with a plan to commit one of the biggest robberies in Canada's history. Mitchell offered him $100,000 for information about the exact time of the next shipment, and he happily accepted the offer. On April 17, 1974, around midnight, Mitchell received a call confirming that the gold had arrived. The team was ready to act. The guard at the airport warehouse received a phone call, saying, Has my man arrived there yet? And then there was a knock at the door. It was a guy in an Air Canada uniform and a counterfeit security pass. It was Stephen Reed. The guard immediately reacted, saying, Your boss is looking for you. Lynn hung up. After that, Reed pulled out his gun and handcuffed the guard, demanding the key to the shipment boxes. Unfortunately, the guard didn't have the key, so Reed managed to use tools from the warehouse to snap the padlock. With the guard handcuffed to a pipe and a box over his head, the gang loaded the gold into a cart and made their way to the getaway car. The police arrived almost immediately, but by that time, the gang was long gone. They successfully managed to make it in just under 20 minutes clean without any traces or even victims and eluding every security measure in place. Leaving the authorities and the whole country impressed and shocked at the same time. While securing $750,000 in gold, the modern equivalent of $5 million. This was the beginning of public recognition of their unique style of operation and also a worry for the authorities about the financial safety and stability of the country. In just 20 minutes, they managed to alert the public about their presence, affect all present security and governmental authorities in the country, and make their way into the heist records of history. For the next few years, they managed to commit a massive number of robberies throughout Canada and become number one among the most wanted criminals in the country. With all governmental authorities on their tail, they fled to the U.S. to explore the new ground and continue on their criminal path to richness. They were unstoppable. They arrived in Florida, which was like a paradise for them, and established their base in a comfortable house near the beach. The gang began their activity, shifting their focus to banks, and after several successful robberies, they developed a routine they would meticulously research potential targets and, after selecting one, study logistics, mapping escape routes, timing stoplights and traffic. Right before the robbery, they would rent a hideout apartment, acquire fake IDs, guns and disguises. Every detail, every step, and every action was calculated and planned to the second. Engine, which is exactly why they were able to complete all their robberies in a matter of minutes without being noticed or caught such an impressive mode of operation frightened and amazed ordinary people, as well as governmental protection agencies alike. After their successful robbery spree in Florida, they became increasingly prominent among the police and other governmental forces, which were trying to close in on them more and more as their activity progressed, so they made a strategic decision to move to another place, both from the ongoing pressure of the authorities. Else they decided to head west specifically in California, San Diego. As usual, they rented several apartments and houses throughout the city for various purposes, hideouts, stash houses for equipment, and so on. Soon after establishing themselves, they began dissecting the details of the place, and they realized that they'd managed to find a treasure trove waiting for them. The land was rich in bank branches of major banks in America. It was a true gold mine, in one several week spree, they managed to rob four major bank branches in California, resulting in almost $100,000 in revenue. 
Here we've come to a point in the story where we can finally find out the origin of the name, the Stopwatch Gang. It's in California that they earned their place among the most wanted by the FBI and became known as the Stopwatch Gang. During their robberies, there were some witnesses, and all of them reported that one of the criminals wore a big stopwatch around his neck, which he looked at and checked over the course of the robbery. Considering their notable speed, combined with their flawless execution, this name is definitely a match. But this was only a warm-up for them. For all the success they were having, going from one bank to the next, the trio had begun to worry that their luck might soon end. This time they needed to do something big, something that could give them what they wanted the most and enough of it for a very long time. They sifted through the list of the most profitable banks in the area, and they found what they were looking for a bank branch that had a constant and substantial flow of money at the same time, while having relatively easy access for the gang. The perfect match happened to be a branch of the Bank of America in San Diego. Learning from their experience, they now always read the press material about them, analyzing witness reports to ensure their future inconspicuous appearance. They noticed that witnesses were most likely to remember the most obvious details. So now they constantly experimented with their looks to make sure no one would get suspicious. They closely and carefully observed and analyzed the place. When the money was transferred in and out of the bank, by whom? How strong was the security system? How many visitors there were daily? And so on. After collecting the necessary data and radically transforming their appearance, altering their skin color, putting on large glasses, fake beards and wigs, expensive suits, and even attaching clear bandages to their fingers to avoid leaving fingerprints. On the morning of September 23, 1980, they were finally ready to go inside and complete the job. For this robbery, they would need to blend in with the crowd, so their transformed look was perfect for this occasion. Reed and Wright arrived separately within several minutes and took their positions inside the bank, while Mitchell was in a car outside of the bank's walls, awaiting the money truck. Finally, after some time, a red truck stopped at the front entrance with a six-foot, 220-pound guard with nine years on the job, entering the bank to get the cash from the vault. When he was carrying the bags, he came close to Reed, and the operation had officially begun. He poked his gun into the guard's stomach and gave his usual line, this is a robbery, don't be a hero, or I'll kill you. As the guard later reported to the authorities, Reed's voice was calm and professional, even almost polite. This was one of their special characters, which distinguished them from any other robbers in recorder history, and simultaneously served them as their own stealth mode, so to speak. Wright immediately came up and took out the guard's gun, while telling everyone to lie down without any noise, as they each picked up two massive bags, so full of bricks of cash that they had become rectangular. After that, they calmly came out of the bank and disappeared from the radars within minutes, quick and clean, as always. By the end of the day, the photos of their robbery were broadcast nationwide as the three men who committed the largest bank robbery in the history of California, leaving with $283,000, equivalent to today's $1 million in broad daylight within several minutes. This outlandish endeavor was one of the most impactful and successful in their resume, which provided them with much needed money and multinational fame but it was also a turning point for them as a criminal gang. After the operation, they were supposed to burn all the disguises and other possible pieces of evidence, but instead, while they were preparing to drive back into hiding, they were prompted by some police officers walking nearby, so they quickly decided to drop everything into a dumpster, hoping that the garbage truck would soon dispose of it. This was the only mistake they have ever made, and it turned out to be a critical one. Later that day, an elderly couple was going by, looking for aluminum cans in the dumpsters, and they came across the one with their stuff, and immediately noticed green Bank of America bags together with wigs, beards, clothes, and fake license plates. Investigators were able to obtain a partial fingerprint from one of the bags, and a copy of the fake car license with Wright's photo on it. Will fix the authorities, 
after all these years, finally had something that could allow them to stop and capture the gang, the rope slowly began to tighten around their necks. With the money from their successful job at the Bank of America, the group started to plan their new life, unaware of what was going on with the authorities and not knowing that their plans were about to be wrecked. They were ready to retire from the bank robbing and were even thinking about surgically changing their appearance to maximally disguise themselves. They ventured to their hideout located in Sedona, Arizona, near Slide Rock State Park, far from crowded and busy cities. They even began to fit in well and blend in with the small local community, yet still unsuspecting. After several undisturbed months, Reed managed to buy a personal plane and take flight lessons in the area, planning some day to slip across the border, while Mitchell and Wright bought comfortable houses and lived in Oak Creek Canyon. They thought that they could finally live in peace and harmony with their perfect future planned ahead. Unfortunately, the harmony couldn't continue indefinitely while they were living their naively comfortable lives. The FBI was approaching them closer each day. Several agents were sent undercover to Sedona to observe and track the stopwatch gang while waiting for arrest warrants. Their location in Oak Creek Canyon was perfectly selected. The terrain nearby was steep and rugged, with only one point of entry, so it was impossible to go in undetected. The Bureau had been tracking the trio but couldn't yet confirm their identities until a confidential informant revealed their names. Surprisingly, the informant was a man called Donnie Hollingsworth, a Canadian former football player who had helped the gang back in the 1974 gold heist because he was himself a local criminal back then and made a deal to help them for a part of the gold. He was now operating a crystal meth business which had caused the deaths of several people and after the FBI tracked him down, he accepted their conditions to exchange the names behind the stopwatch gang for leniency. So with all necessary precautions, the FBI carefully examined their daily routines, commutes and activities to be ready to act at any second and to succeed in their capture, no matter what. Finally, on October 30th, 1980, a judge issued arrest warrants for each of the members, Stephen Reed, Patrick Mitchell and Lionel Wright, on charges of bank robbery and conspiracy. On October 31st, the agents arrested Reed while he was driving his Camaro to the airport for a flying trip. Wright was arrested at the house while he was sleeping. As an FBI report noted, only Reed admitted his identity, while Wright wouldn't. He was the only one of three who didn't do it. Such was his character. In federal court, both of them pleaded guilty to the armed robbery of the Bank of America and received 20-year sentences, each in a separate federal prison. Wright went to Leavenworth Maximum Security Prison in Kansas, while Reed landed at the federal prison in Marion, Illinois, for the highest security facility in the system, housing the 500 most dangerous criminals in the country. Unfortunately, Mitchell wasn't in the vicinity of their hideout location. He was on a holiday, so he escaped from the arrest by chance alone. For the next several years, he was mostly in hiding, but occasionally came out to rob a department store in one place and some small banks in the other. He definitely lacked his colleagues' support. He got sloppy in the planning and execution, because of which he was finally tracked down in 1983 in a small town in Florida and apprehended by the FBI. He was standing trial for the heists in the banks of America, Arizona, and Arkansas, and was sent to the maximum security prison in Arizona with a 48-year sentence just for the crimes within the U.S. and an additional 20-year sentence for the gold heist in Canada. This was the end of this truly captivating story of the Stopwatch Gang, one of the most formidable and impressive crime groups in history. They were remembered and depicted in a variety of documentaries, books and other media for their remarkable abilities to commit meticulously planned non-violent robberies within minutes and get away with no traces successfully evading the multinational governmental authorities on their tail for years. If you've enjoyed watching this video, don't forget to support the channel by liking and subscribing. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave them in the comments below. See you in the next one.